Members, item 5 on the order paper is the adjournment. The question is that the Assembly do now adjourn, and in conjunction with the Business Committee, I have given leave to Mr Mervyn Storey to raise the matter of the future of the health service in North Antrim. The proposer of the topic will have 15 minutes, and all other speakers will have approximately four minutes. I call Mr Storey. Story. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Deputy Speaker. First of all, can I apologise to the House for not being present at uh, question uh, 13 in relation to the Justice Minister, and I apologise to the House and also to the Minister for being absent. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I welcome the opportunity in early in this mandate to raise the issues of concern uh, and also uh, place on record appreciation uh, in relation to the provision of health in my North London constituency. I'm also well aware of the timing of this particular uh, debate, given that we may soon have a, a public debate and a discussion around the findings and the recommendations of the Bengoa panel. And obviously, I recognise that that may uh, limit what uh, I hoped that the Minister would say but I see that the Minister uh, is not present, so therefore uh, we will have to talk to ourselves and hope that the Minister uh, finds uh, time to read the Hansard report of the comments that we want to make. I'm also aware of the comments that were made by Prof Professor Ben Goa when uh, he was appointed earlier on this year, uh, when he said that over the last 40 years there has been a focus in health on planning around structures instead of planning around patient needs and outcomes. Members will not be therefore surprised that uh, there are structures in the provision of health care in Northampton that I want to refer to because I think that some of them are pivotal and some of them are essential in terms of the continued deliverance of health provision uh, in Northampton. I want at the outset, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, to pay tribute to those who work in the health service and who provide for us on a day and daily basis a health service that is uh, a service that we ought to be proud of and something that, and it's easy, uh, and I know that the opposition parties, and we see how well they're arrayed this evening, uh, and I've lost count of many of them there are, but in terms of the opposition parties, it's always easy to be critical. It's always easy to find the, the point where you will criticise something, uh, but it's a lot more difficult to actually come and give credit uh, for when things go well. And to those almost 12,000 staff uh, that work in the Northern Trust area, I say to them a word of thanks uh, and appreciation. With a population of some 436,000, a budget of some 600 million, the Minister, and I welcome the Minister now to the House, and she will not now have to read uh, the Hansard uh, comments that I made earlier. The, the Minister will not be surprised that I want to concentrate on the time that I do have, uh, particularly in regards to the Causeway locality, uh, which covers, and members will be know that there are four localities now within the Northern Trust, uh, and since there has been a reorganisation of the Trust, and, and again I pay tribute to those who have helped in the turnaround of the Causeway Trust, because there was some time ago there was concerns in relation to the future existence of the Trust. Indeed, there was some talk about it maybe being merged or taken over by the Western Trust. However, we now have, I believe, a degree of stability. And I want to pay tribute to those who have worked hard over the last number of months in regards to that particular issue. But I want to concentrate on a number of elements of what, what I believe are key in terms of delivery in relation to uh, health. My other colleagues from Northampton will make reference to uh, other elements of the provision in Northampton when they make their, their contribution. Let me turn to the Causeway Hospital. Northampton is uh, unique in many ways, but it's unique in the fact that it doesn't have uh, within its jurisdiction in terms of its parliamentary boundary, uh, a, an acute hospital. We are served by two acute hospitals, which are uh, one in East Londonderry uh, and the other in South Antrim. And so uh, I well remember uh, having 
uh, had opportunity both in my previous job and as uh, a patient and a parent, uh, the access to what was the Root Hospital. Uh, and then, of course, head along with the Mary Rankin in Coleraine and became the new Causeway Hospital. And in our area, we have bought into the provision that there is in the Causeway Hospital. And I welcome the fact that back in 2011, there was a commitment by the then Health Minister to ensure that the Causeway Hospital, and I quote, is here to stay. And I trust that that will continue to be the case. Of course, we had all the naysayers who spread about, I have to say, uh, very dangerous comments that it was going to close. And, and I think we have to be cautious and careful whenever uh, people use uh, a platform for only political purposes, when there is no substance to what is being said, and it causes fear, it causes concern, and it causes anxiety, first of all, to the patients that are served by the hospital, and then secondly, by the staff that work in that hospital. So we know that, I want to drill down some what into some of the details in relation to the, the Causeway Hospital. And at the outset as well, I want to pay tribute to the Causeway Support Group uh, that I have uh, on many occasions over the last number of months uh, worked with. And, and I think of people like Dr. Owen Finnegan and others in that group who make an invaluable contribution, uh, an informed contribution to the future of the provision of the service at the Causeway Hospital. Uh, we know that over the over 65s account for some 30% of our population, uh, the highest, I have to say, of any of the trusts. And so I think that we need to uh, recognize that that is a particular challenge. Uh, and as someone who now uh, is heading towards that, that age, uh, I'm uh, always careful to ensure that I declare an interest uh, because I think that we need to, and the, the trust does acknowledge that there is a particular challenge in terms of the age profile of the trust area. But I think the other figure that's important is that 70% of our inpatient beds are from that category of over 65s at the Causeway Hospital. And I, I think that that puts a particular focus and a particular challenge towards the delivery of services at the Causeway. Uh, the, the trust uh, the over 75 population is expected to grow by some 32 per cent between 2012 and 2021. The Causeway Coast and Glens has the highest projected rise in over 75s in the uh, health service area. And the Causeway has the fastest growing elderly population in the region over the next 10 years. And as someone whose father has spent most of last year uh, in the Causeway Hospital, uh, other than a few months in the Royal Victoria, I know all too well the care and attention that is given by the staff in that hospital. And if it wasn't for their care and attention, I have no doubt that my father's health today would have been severely limited. Indeed, with regards to our A&E, and, &E, and let's uh, look at this particular issue, because A&E &E is pivotal to the delivery of the service, I believe, uh, at the Causeway. And on a year-on-year -year basis, we've seen a rise of some 2 to 4 per cent in attendance at the a &E. However, when you look at the figures for the over 75s, their, atten their attendance has grown by some 4 to 6 per cent. And so again, a particular issue that needs to be taken into account. On elective admissions, it has grown by some 3% in 14-15 and by some 7% in 15-16. And so that clearly demonstrates the need for the retention of the services that particularly are focused in around delivering for our senior citizens, delivering for our A&E, &E. but also I think that we need to tie in with that a comment that was made by the Causeway Support Group in that they made reference in one of their publications recently that the Causeway has an excellent internationally recognized chronic pain clinic which remains under-resourced but has the potential to become a regional center of excellence with increasing uh, elderly population and obviously all the associated challenges 
that that brings. And I think that that brings us to the point of ensuring that the Cosby Hospital is given its place in terms of regional services. We hear a lot, and obviously the Minister, and I said this prior to her just coming into the House, will be shortly in receipt of, if she hasn't already been in receipt of the, the Bengoa report, and obviously there will be talk about the regional services. What we want to see in the Causeway, and what I want to see, is to build upon the expertise that we do have, particularly around the issue of uh, the chronic pain uh, and other services. Obviously, in recent days, we have had some negative comment, and it would be remiss of me if I didn't say, uh, and I say this with all the sympathy uh, of those families that uh, unfortunately couldn't uh, concur with my comments in terms of the service that they believe was not provided when there were particular problems and particular issues which uh, led to uh, very sad circumstances and they have been highlighted recently in the media and I'm referring of course to the obstetric uh, deliveries some 1500 per annum in the causeway and there is a, a, a continual need for a consultant led unit and obviously it would be uh, a concern uh, that uh, that would be replaced with uh, a midwife based service in the views of the geographic isolation and there's also a reasonable argument for the causeway to be a major obstetric center for uh, the the trust in view of the proximity of the Antrim area hospital uh, to Belfast and so I say that in uh, recognition also of the concerns that have been raised even recently and so I want to place on record the, the issue in regards to the continuance of the hospital, the services that underpins that I think are vitally important and ensure that we make progress in providing for our over 65s or over 75s and the ever increasing population in that part of the world. Let me turn to Dalriada uh, in uh, the northern part of the Northern Trust and in North Antrim and uh, the previous uh, Minister uh, and others are well aware of the uh, campaign that there was when there was a proposal to close Dalriada. And of course, uh, the people in Ballycastle and the Glens do feel a particular challenge in relation to their isolation and their distance, given their proximity either towards to levitate towards the Antomeria Hospital or having to go to the Causeway Hospital. Uh, I want to just lay on record our appreciation in terms of the trust commitment to the Dalriada Pathfinder model. And I believe that that is giving us uh, an example of what can be done in terms of uh, provision. I leave it there because I'm well aware that my time is fast moving on because I want to move to the Robinson Hospital. Uh, and of course, the Robinson Hospital in Ballymone is a unique jewel in the Northern Trust's crown, given its history and given the contribution that Samuel Robinson made and in his trust still continues to make for the health provision. Uh, and I would appreciate if the Minister could maybe give us an update as to where we're at in relation to the proposed capital build at the Robinson Hospital. And it plays an, an, a very important part. And I want to pay tribute to the GPs in the health centre who uh, work in conjunction with the Robinson Hospital. Uh, and I believe that that particular uh, community provision is something which is an example of how community hospitals should be at the centre of our community and could help to alleviate, as they do, the pressures in regards to the causeway. Obviously, health is very multifaceted and there are many elements to it, none least the fact that when we come to the issue of residential care, it is a particular challenge for the trusts. And I want to, again, in closing, make reference to the, uh, the Rodden's residential home. There's been a concern for some considerable time. Uh, obviously, no admissions in terms of, of the Robinson, despite requests that have been made, despite circumstances where I believe that people 
could have been admitted to the Robinson uh, to the to the Rodens, but they weren't. And I'd ask the minister to uh, look at this particular issue because it is unacceptable that people in my constituency have to travel at long distances and families long distances to get residential care. I also, in conclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker, would appreciate if the Minister could maybe give us an update in regards to the renal dialysis unit that I've been campaigning for, for since I was elected to this House in 2003. Uh, and we believe that the business case has now been completed, that progress is being made, and maybe the Minister will be able to tell us when that can be delivered in the Causeway Hospital. I conclude, Mr Deputy Speaker, by saying these are only a small element That's of the provision of health in the Northampton area, but key component parts, which I trust will continue to be delivered and built upon in the future. Aram, sir, Philip McGuigan. I call Philip McGuigan. Gurram Elgut, last can call you. August Ern Kid Golsis, uh as Fed General Young, as honor do of a Glorch, Don Kid Ur, the channel for in topic show, August as privilege, a do of a Gobber, Son Dini Antrim Hui. Uh Kermogut. Uh last can call your it it's been a while, I think ten years in fact, since I last spoke in this chamber. So just at the beginning of uh, my contribution today, can I say and reiterate that it's a great honour and privilege to be allowed to represent the citizens of North Antrim. And along with my Sinn Féin team, I hope to do it well. Uh, whether you live in Kerry Glen or Glenravel Glen, Ballantoy, Ballybogie, Dunloy or Dervik, Cloney or Clough, Ballycastle or Brookshean, and everywhere in between, my office door will be open. Uh, I want to thank my old sparring partner, Mervyn Story, from our days in Ballamoney Borough Council, for bringing this debate to the House. Uh, and I'm delighted to be reunited with Mervyn again and look forward to working constructively. Uh, with him and all the other North Antrim members on behalf of the people that we serve. Uh, the future of health care provision in North Antrim is one such important issue for those citizens. Indeed, it's probably the most important issue. Uh, and nobody could underestimate the challenges that this brings uh, to the Minister, and I'm delighted that the Minister is here uh, for this contribution. So the challenges for the Minister, the Northern Health and Social Care Trust, and all health care providers. And just before continuing, uh, can I also thank the work of those who work in the healthcare profession for their selfless service and excellent care. And in my new role now, I hope to work positively with the management of the Northern Health and Social Care Trust and its staff to ensure the health and well-being needs of all my constituents are met. In my three short weeks in this role, I have already received representations from a number of constituents covering waiting times for referrals and other specific treatment issues. So I am acutely aware of the current pressures facing citizens requiring treatment and in turn the onus that this puts on the health service and on health service staff. I welcome the words of the minister uh, in this chamber last week on another, in another health related debate when she said, uh, I wish to reiterate that tackling excessive waiting times is high on my agenda for delivering improvements in the health service. I want to assure patients and their families again that long waiting times are completely unacceptable to me and that I understand the worry and stress that people feel when they are waiting to hear when and they will be seen. And who couldn't agree with that? Uh, call you. North Antrim is a largely rural constituency covering the large geographical area including Rathlin Island. And this in itself throws up challenges, challenges of travelling time, of access to services, of emergency response times and much more. Uh, ambulance response times are a genuine concern in life-threatening situations for people living in the Glens and other remote geographical locations in North Antrim, and this aspect needs careful consideration in any future plans for the health service. Constituents of North Antrim, uh, as has already been said, are currently served by two acute hospitals, the Causeway and Coleraine, and Antrim Area Hospital, and by two community hospitals the Robinson and Balamoni and the Dalrada and Ballycastle. And when my colleague had twice as long to speak, he could afford to go into twice as much detail. So, you know, can I just say that, uh, you know, I have supported and been on record as supporting uh, the efforts to protect and build upon all these local facilities, and I will continue to make the case for equality and access for the people of North Antrim. I know that the Health Minister uh, is currently studying the report on the future of health services from the the, led by Professor Bengoa, and I look forward to hearing uh, the Minister's views on how we as a society can secure and improve health service delivery across the full spectrum of health provision. And that report, uh, approach will require careful nourishment by securing and building 
on Ask the strength. Member to draw his remarks to close. Okay, and our current provision, and we can deliver better outcomes for the people and ensure that our health service works for the people and makes our lives better. This is a difficult task given the finite budget and require parties across the floor in this House to continue uh, to achieve. The member's this. time is up. Okay, Grimmel. I call Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And just to remind members, it's four minutes. Okay. Right. Thank you. Can I thank and congratulate my constituency colleague Mervyn Story on bringing this debate forward to the House? It is unfortunate that it, the timing is that we're on the wrong side of the publication of Bungo because I think it was actually meant to be in front of the Health Committee last week. So possibly if Bungo had been reported and published, this debate may have been slightly more certainly. Aware, you know, but the, the panel, particularly Professor ben, uh, Bingo, did visit the causeway, and I believe that was a very, very valuable visit. And so I trust that that at least gave some input in terms of his thinking, in terms of, of what the recommendations may or may not say. Members, an extra minute. Thank you very much. Uh, but, but it was, you know, and I know the member started off uh, with the causeway in a detailed brief on the causeway. But I think one of the th things we saw out of every health review that came, by, came about or, or is proposed is actually about that provision of facilities. And when he was proposing the motion, that's when, we're, when Mr Storey was finishing up, he touched on the Rodens and Pinewood, our two statutory care homes that are still left within the constituency. And I think every member who has represented North Antrim has made representation and presentation about the continuation and the support of those two faci facilities and also about allowing a permanent emissions policy so that the security and the certainty of not just those homes as facilities but security and provision for the people who are trying to get into them, who are currently in them and also the staff that are working in them. And I know there have been proposals in the past by the Trust to facilitate Pinewood or to move in a different direction. And it's really just to get an update from the Minister how that ties in with the Trust thinking, if it's there in Bagoa, if it's something we shall, still should be looking at. In regards to, I suppose, Dalriada and the excellent campaign that I think was, that was raised and, and fought by the community there, and the retention of Dalriada not just as a facility or the provision of the step-down beds, which were essential and star, still are crucial for the Robinson, for the causeway, to continue. It's also about the MS respite provision that is present in Dalriada. And I know the, the, the former member of Sinn Féin for North Antrim, like all of us, were very vocal in Dalriada, the Rodens and Pinewood, to make sure that that permanent provision was still there, especially when it does cover the North Coast area. And it's not just about the Glens, because the, cause that MS respite provision goes across into East London Derry as well. So it's, I would like reassurance from the Minister that Bangoa isn't going to start and raise the heads of the problems that the closures of the potential closure of Pinewood, the potential closure of the Rodens, or the potential closure of Dalriada, or some provision of Dalriada may actually bring about. When we did talk at, at that stage in regard to the future of Dalriada as a step-down facility, one of the things that became apparent when it was debated a number of times in this House was actually the provision of care provision and home support and, and home, home care packages. And that seems to me, from a constituency level and from the level of work coming through my office, is there seems to be a greater demand on care packages and the difficulty in actually providing them, should it be from the statutory service or actually from private providers? Because I'm currently working with a number of families who would like to get a loved one home but the care package isn't there. And it's that family's, I suppose, pride and dignity because they don't want their relative to be considered or referred to as a bed blocker. But while that facility isn't there to bring them home to, the, to their own home where they can look after them with additional support, it puts that pressure on them and also on the facilities themselves. Um, I know we've only got four minutes, so just br a brief touch was, and, and Rathlin was mentioned, and it's just in, in regard to Bengoa and, and the increased pressures that are coming on the Northern Trust and the Health Service, I just want reassurance from the Minister that the full-time nursing provision is also still going to be maintained on Rathlin and that there's no threat to it either through Bengoa or any reduction in, in the Health Service. Um, in regards then, just as, I suppose in a finishing comment, if the Minister could maybe have a word with the Chief Executive of the Northern Health Trust, Tony Stevens and see if he could actually respond to some of my correspondence.
that would be quite helpful as well. I call Paul Frew. Thank you very much. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I rise to support my colleague Mervyn's story for bringing this to the, the floor of the Assembly. Mervyn has been many years campaigning for decent and, and better health service uh, for the people of North Antrim, and I commend him for that and for this debate today and highlighting the issue in front of the, the Minister. And I'm glad that the Minister uh, is able to make it here also for this adjournment debate. I suppose as someone who looks back in the history of, of the constituents of North Antrim and the health service within it, I think. Not one of us uh, won't recognise that when we meet with the hierarchy of the service and quiz them about the historical linkage and, and hospital sightings, they, every one of them will, will mention the fact that they, they feel now that Antrim Area Hospital was built in the wrong place. Now, that's nothing against Antrim, certainly not, but it could well have saved an acute hospital. It may well have saved. Uh, 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 saved money, uh, better provisions, uh, less buildings in North Antrim and, in fact, the whole of Northern Ireland. So, decisions that are taken now echo for decades in any given area of Northern Ireland. That is why it is very important when we do make decisions, we make the right ones. Uh, and we have a real duty of care to worry about not just the here and now, but the next generation coming along and the generation after that because they will be impacted by the decisions that ministers here in this House today make. Will the member give way? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I thank the member for, for giving way. And he talks about, about long-term planning. Isn't it also important that the, the minister um, continues to invest in um, preventative measures um, that can help um, save money now and in the future uh, as well? A number of constituents have contacted me, and I've been in contact with the minister on one specific example, which is diabetes education, which um, has the potential to be a massive cost um, to the health service in the future. Isn't it important that we educate people and take as many preventative steps as we can in order to help people now and in the future? Yeah, yes, Members, thank you for that contribution because that is a very important point. And it's maybe not even, whilst, whilst it will be the burden on the health service and on the health minister, it will be a burden for us all because ultimately we will, we will all pay for it, either in our pocket or in our health. Uh, and we will all be burdened or relied upon, uh, rely on the health service uh, to get us out of the mess uh, if we can. That's a very, very important point. But it's very hard. Uh, even though we talk, and civil service land talks about preventative spend, and it's a great phrase, nobody really actually knows what it means, or the cost of it, or how much do we pay now to get results in the future. And it's very hard to justify that in a balance sheet or in a budget line. And that's something where the minister, I suppose, have to, has to be brave. Any minister has to be brave and say, well, look, here's what we feel. If we spend this now, preventative spend, if we educate the public in this, then this is what we will save long term. And it's not only in pen pennies and pence, it's in health. And I, I think if there's anywhere that can be done, it is in health. It is in health service. Because that has the potential, or health and our health service has the potential to, to bust us, to bankrupt any nation, any nation state, especially in the civilised world. So it's something that needs to be looked at. As someone who goes through the hospitals, meets nurses who work, meets doctors who work in, our, in North Antrim hospitals, I see the real value and the worth in North Antrim, of all the hospitals, it's nearly too many to mention. I'm nearly scared to mention them in case the minister thinks there are too many and we should start to close some. But they all have specific service and they all provide specific service and specific needs. And I suppose when you look at the, the Pathfinder uh, experiment or, or programme in, in Del Riata, that I suppose typifies what the community can add to all of this. Because there you had a facility under threat. The community got together with the elected representatives, all of us, and we worked through plans and progress as to what could happen. And, and I believe that's something the minister can look at, pick up from, and run with. Uh, and that maybe could be a pilot scheme that could be washed out throughout the whole of Northern Ireland. Something that could be of the potential. Now, it won't be specific, but it could be. You could change that and use it in general right across this this country. And that's something that people will really value. People want a piece of the health service. They want to feel valued in that so, so that when they need the health service, it will be there and they will be reassured by it. One thing I will raise in my short time, Minister, is the need for intermediate beds in Palomina. We don't have any. And it's something I think we should look towards. Uh, and uh, of course, it's not easy and we don't want to work in patchworks, but 
The fact that we have a major town of Bilamina with no uh, intermediate beds is, is something that really needs to be looked at. Thank you. Okay, I call Philip Logan. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And, uh, I want to thank my colleague, Mr Storey, for bringing this uh, debate to the, the House today. Um, we are very fortunate in, in, in Northern Ireland, leaving North Antrim aside, we are very fortunate in North Antrim to have an excellent health and care system. Uh, Mr McGuigan picked up on some of the issues coming through his constituency office, and even at this early stage, I am having the same. So we are well aware, and, and, and I welcome what the Minister said last week at uh, question time, that the waiting lists are they are not defendable. I am welcome that. But leaving that aside, because that is an issue all over, um, when people get to the other end of that waiting list, the service that they receive is first class. The service they receive from our, our GPs and from our, service, uh, our, our, our frontline service people is first class. And we are very fortunate in this past year, particularly in Ballymena, within North Antrim, to have had significant investment, needful investment, but significant in health care uh, facilities. Ballymena has gained a state of the art centre. Uh, officially opened by the then Health Minister Simon Hamilton on the 18th of February. Ballymena Health and Care Centre is the largest health care facility of its kind to date in Northern Ireland. Uh, Mr Well said that it is uh, something that he would love to have seen in his time as Health Minister created 20 more times over Northern Ireland. Um, so of course we are leading the way on that. And I would like to pay tribute at this stage to some of our local councillors uh, for lobbying for that health and care centre uh, for many years. Uh, and we are delighted to see that. It, it boasts six GP practices, uh, locally accessible, accessible acute, primary and community care services, a mental health consultation wing and a separate children's wing, and also dental services. This building provides a hub for health care in the local area. It allows primary care, mental health and other teams to be co-located, which makes health care as a whole more efficient. There is also a new ambulance station in Ballymena. Uh, it's the new North Sector Division headquarters consolidating the activities from Coleraine into Ballymena, uh, which was done to streamline administration and uh, training and provide training and, and make that all more efficient. It provides accommodation for around 58 st staff, and up to 12 vehicles can be garaged there to make sure that they're long term, uh, they're more long term uh, viable. I guess. Um, I was very pleased to see in July of this year at a meeting of Mid and East Antrim Council's planning committee that it was decided. Uh, that uh, First Presbyterian Church in Ahockle, in my home village, is to be transformed into a new medical centre, catering for around 5,000 patients. There will be minimal change to the historic building, which dates back to 1858. Uh, I think maybe Mr Storey remembers it being built. Um, but that will be a very useful modern healthcare facility that will serve the local community there. These moves forward for healthcare in North Antrim are great. Uh, but we cannot be complacent. There is still much to do. And like a good Presbyterian, I have a three-point sermon prepared here. I'll, I'll get on to it very quickly. Investing in people, investing in the system, and investing in the future. Investing in people. We need this assembly to be investing in our people, employed in the healthcare centres. I recognise that the contribution made by staff in the NHS is invaluable to the functioning of Northern Ireland's health service. I also know of the pressures facing the profession, especially around staff numbers. Investing in the system. We need this assembly to be investing in the system of our health care, investing in health infrastructure, and this is something that the DUP would like to achieve. Um, and we've already seen some of those benefits uh, within Ballymena. Uh, a digitalised system would be uh, fantastic for, uh, for, for the rest of Northern Ireland. We also have a need. We also have. We also have to have a continued strategy across all departments to tackle health inequalities something which is one of the indicators on the programme for government, and investing in the future. We need this Assembly to be investing in the future of our health care, investing in a health, and service, a health service fit for the 21st century. That means more innovation. We need to move towards we'll ask digital, a, member to draw his remarks to a digitalised health care system with electronic health and care records for Northern Ireland. E-health has already helped revolutionise the delivery of health and social care for patients. And to finish, I think the member's time is sure. up. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to bring this. Thank you. I call Jim Allister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, to distill the health needs and issues of North Antrim into four minutes is probably impossible. But I think if there's one core issue of concern as we go forward, particularly uh, as we uh, await the Bengoa panel, it is to underwrite and underscore the necessity of maintaining the acute facilities of the Causeway Hospital, uh, because without that, 
uh, there is such a gap in provision for the whole northern part of the North Antrim constituency that it is unthinkable. And the Minister's predecessor made this commitment in this House, that he committed to retaining Causeway Hospital as a small acute hospital. The model for services will be based around an acute hospital in Coleraine with an emergency department and supporting clinical services. My first question to the Minister today is, can she reaffirm that commitment, uh, uh, with or without the Bengoa panel report? Is there a commitment to maintain that? Because that is vital to the services uh, uh, that uh, uh, are afforded to the people in North Antrim. Uh, equally, we need to maintain the maternity unit there on a consultant-led basis is the ideal, uh, and that must be uh, maintained. Now, Mr Story refers to people uh, raising rumours and attacks. Well, of course, the primary individual with profile who raised a rumour 18 months ago about the future of the causeway was his MP. And so I'm a little surprised that in this debate today he's been attacking him in that regard. But there is concern, and there's concern in the context of the Bengoa report where the whole ethos, we are told, is about moving towards more community care, and yet many of us cannot see it in our communities. We do not see the advance of community care. What we hear about from many of our constituents is a contraction, not expansion in community care. Less time, not more time for the individuals in their own homes. So we have this dichotomy of a, a protestation that everything looks rosy by moving forward, by intensifying community care, and therefore we can have less acute hospitals. But the reality that we're seeing in our constituency is very, very different. Hence the necessity to underscore and commit irreversibly to the retention of the Causeway Hospital and the other facilities. And you know, we saw the attempts, the crass attempts, to undo the provision in Ballet Castle in, in, the, in the Dal. And thankfully, that was derailed. But the mentality that induced that situation still, I fear, exists within many of the management structures of the Northern Trust and elsewhere. We've seen successive ministers, not just this minister, but her DUP pre predecessors, refuse to take the fundamental liberating step for the statutory nursing homes of removing the shackles and allowing admissions. Underscoring for many of us again the agenda to try and run down those homes. Because you cannot say, I'm committed to a statutory home and see a future for it, if at the same time you deny the lifeblood of admissions. And the ministers from both parties have failed in that fundamental task of securing the future of those homes by, failing to, to take that, to by failing to take that fundamental step. So I do hope that this debate will be timely. I hope it will not be overcome by disappointing news when the Bengoa panel is Members, published. And I think up. in this debate we've, we're laying down markers of what is needed. Iram Sir, Mark H. Durkin. I call Mark H. Durkin. Uh, uh, this debate does take place in the context that we are still awaiting the publication of the Bengoa report. Uh, Mr. Swan lamented the fact that, that we hadn't seen it yet, and maybe that this uh, debate had initially been tabled in anticipation that we would have. I've actually taken a contrary view to that, and, and I think this might be a case of Mr. Story and subsequently the rest of the MLAs from the constituency getting their retaliation in uh, first. But what today's debate does do, I believe, is underline the importance of the Minister releasing the Ben Gore report as quickly as possible. I I'm not asking the Minister to rush it, and I don't think anyone could accuse her uh, uh, of doing so at this stage. That, that there's a lot to deliberate on, but it is important that we get the report out and for the Minister subsequently or in tandem to reveal her own vision. 
uh, in terms of its implementation, because as long as it isn't out in the public domain, as long as we don't know what is in the Ben Goa report or what the minister reads uh, from the Ben Goa report, there's going to be a cloud over every element of uh, health care and certainly hospital provision right across the north. Uh, a, a lot of people here have touched on Bengoa. I think the point Mr Alistair made there uh, finally w w was very important, and that was around the move towards community care and the need to resource that. Transforming your care was the roadmap to a better health care system, and I think everyone in the chamber here agreed with the direction of travel and indeed probably the destination set out on that map. But the, the, the sad reality is that no one put petrol into the car and we never got out of the forecourt towards reaching that destination. I would not expect the destination outlined in Bengoa to be drastically different, but I think what we have learned is the vast importance of resourcing that journey. And I, I, I think it is imperative that we as an Assembly do all we can to support the Minister in any bids that uh, she makes for her department to receive additional funding to ease the transition to the system of health care that we do, uh, we do need to be sustainable. That does not mean close all hospitals. I think Mr Storey made some very good points in terms of what care or types of care can be provided, specialist care or specialism care in specific areas. That is something that should be explored. It is something that uh, will give heart and some solace to the people working in uh, these areas as well. But, like I said, I would just urge the Minister to – I do not mean get a move on – but to release uh, the, the report as soon as possible, because otherwise we could be back here next week on a different – or she could be back here <laughs> answering MLAs from another constituency, and that could go on and on and on. Adam Sarah and Iris Lantia, Michelle O'Neill, Hon Fregerha. I would ask the Minister for Health, Michelle O'Neill, to respond. Can I thank um, the member for proposing this adjournment debate? And certainly, I've been very impressed by the considered and valuable contributions I think that everybody has made throughout the course of the discussion. I'm going to attempt to raise all of the points that have been raised, and if I don't pick up on anything, I'll, I'll be very happy to. Um, Right to members to confirm, but I think you know the people are. Everybody can talk and agree. I think in terms of where we need to go in terms of healthcare, particularly around the points that have been raised around early intervention and prevention, by tackling health inequalities, about making sure that we have fit for purpose care packages in place. So we need to really seriously look at social care and what we're doing in that end of, of health and social care. I think that we all can agree that we need to invest in people, we need to invest in our workforce, and we need to invest in the future. And the way to do that, I think. We're going to clearly, well, I'm going to articulate um, over the course of the next number of weeks in relation to the response to the, the Bangoa piece. I'll pick up on some of the particular issues around the care homes and the rail unit and other points that members, members have raised. But can I also start, like others, by recognising the work of the Trust and its staff for their service and their commitment to delivery of high quality health services? I, like the proposer or the person, Mr. Story, who brought the debate today, also pay tribute to the hard working staff in the hospitals, those that are delivering health and social care services in the community for their service to the local community and their commitment to delivering high quality health services. I think it is also important to set the context in terms of what care the Northern Trust delivers on a day to day basis and in the environment in which it operates. The Northern Trust area has a population of just under 440,000, so it is the largest resident population in the North. In common with the rest of the North, the demand for health and social care in that trust area grows annually by about approximately 6 per cent. This includes demographic growth, resulting in a higher number of older people with, with complex health needs and comorbidities and increased referrals. In 15-16, the trust had 44,944 people admitted to hospital care and 46,752 day cases. Every year, the trust and partners in the independent sector provide millions of hours of domiciliary care. Despite the scale of the challenges that they face, this is a trust that is working hard and one that is focused on the task at hand, which is to deliver high-quality, safe and effective care in the most efficient manner possible. 
However, we, have to also, we also need to accept and acknowledge the very real pressures that are facing health and social care services right across the north. And they are, I suppose, that they're in, in general terms, but they're obviously relevant to the Northern Trust. A rise in chronic conditions driven by both our ageing population and unhealthy lifestyle habits, increasing demand and over-reliance on hospital services, growing expectations of our population and fast-moving opportunities in technology and medical interventions, workforce challenges and the ongoing financial challenges. The Northern, the Northern Trust has certainly not been immune to the challenges that are facing the wider system, and it would be foolish to think that there are any simple solutions. However, this trust is already engaged in work and working with communities to develop and improve the services it provides for patients, and I welcome the positive commentary that some members have made in relation to that ongoing piece of work. It used the turnaround and support team to provide a strong foundation for the five-year reform and modernisation programme, which is currently underway. The model for services in the Causeway locality has a, has a strong emphasis on integrated, locality-based community services delivered in partnership, a model that supports people to live independently, with home as a first choice, and outside of the home with an accessible locality-based facilities. This model avoids hospitalisation and institutional care and supports prompt discharge where acute intervention is needed. We should be clear that these are the services that patients need. The Trust has no plans to move away from the two acute hospital site model currently in place. Acute services are delivered from Causeway and from Antrim. These hospitals collaboratively work and network with other acute services, particularly in, West, in Belfast and the West. Local hospitals will continue to play an important role in that network, but at the same time we have to work to deliver services through a modern, efficient network that is well placed to take advantage of the advances in medical science and in patient care, which will no doubt continue to be made through the 21st century. Our people deserve no less than this. Mem many members have referred to the Professor Bengoa piece of work in the expert panel, that which is obviously set out to look at the current configuration of services regionally and to provide advice on a new delivery model for HSE services. I intend to bring this work over the um, immediate future to the Executive and to the Health Committee and to this House. And as part of you know, the work that Professor Bengoa and his colleagues engaged with, they engaged with all of the main parties that are represented here and all that have spoken today, the case for change and to agree a vision and set of principles that would underpin reform was set out and agreed upon. So I think that for us in this chamber, it's about we have to all recognise the need to transform the way we deliver health and social care services right across the north. We can't keep doing things the same way and expecting different outcomes. It's ultimately patients who will suffer if we continue to do that. So for me, that goes beyond trusts and hospitals. It's about the radical transformation of health and social care. And we should be under no illusions whatsoever that it's absolutely necessary to safeguard our HSE for this and for future generations. I have received the expert panel's report earlier in the summer and have been taking my time to fully consider all the recommendations and the implications that have been made throughout it. And as I said, I intend to publish my response and my plans. I'm going to um, publish the panel's report, but also my plans for reforming HSE in the immediate future. Members picked up on a number of issues, and as I said, if I haven't picked up on them all, I'm happy to, to I will look at Hansard and respond in writing, but particularly in relation to some of the issues around, uh, for example, the renal unit and, and where we're sitting with that. Um, the department has approved the strategic outline case back in September of 2015 for the expansion of renal services, and the proposal is to establish a medical-led satellite unit in Causeway Hospital, which will provide renal services for up to 50 patients. The estimated capital cost of the project is expected to be around about £3 million. The Northern Trust is currently developing the associated outline business case and then following submission to and approval, approval by the Department, this project can be considered alongside other capital projects within the HSC Trust capital priorities. In relation to um, Rodden's and residential care homes in North Antrim, following, um, and the members will be aware of this, but following confirmation that Four Seasons Healthcare was proposing to close seven of its care homes. My pre predecessor asked the Health and Social Care Board to halt the review and the current process, examining the future role and functions of the residential care homes as a precautionary measure. And I have now received information from the Board on the outcome of the review, and I am considering it along with the advice from my officials. I have yet to make a final decision on the future of the statutory residential care homes, but I will ensure that the right care services are available for patients, and you can be assured that that will remain a priority for me. If you, let me just run through the issues. And in relation to um, 
the issue of Rathlin. I think it was yourself that raised the issue of Rathlin. Um, as far as I'm aware, there's a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week um, nursing cover in Rathlin. But if there are any particular concerns in relation to Rathlin, I encourage you to, to contact me after the debate, and I'm happy to pick that up. Um, and in relation to, again, just in relation to care, care packages, um, I think it's so so important that we actually review how we support older people. So one of the things that I intend to do. Um, in the immediate future also is to look at a review of health and so of social care services and how we support older people. I don't think it's good enough that um, trusts don't have enough um, people in-house to provide domiciliary care packages, but also they're finding real difficulty in recruiting people from the independent sector to also provide them. And I think in, during question time last week I talked about some of the challenges there. Domiciliary care workers are the lowest paid people in the health service. Do, often if they work in the independent sector they don't get transport costs, so that causes particular problems. It brings their take-home pay down even further. So, I think there, there are areas that we need to, to focus on. Um, I'll give way to the member. Just. No, it was just in regard to the rods and the pine rods. She referred to the review of care homes that had been started by our predecessor. And she's looking at the recommendations that's coming out of that. Is that standalone and separate from Bungoa, or will the whole thing be incorporated into Bungoa? You see, I, I, I wonder about the expectations that are out there about Bangoa. Bangoa, I don't believe, he was looking at the whole system. You remember the principles that your party also signed up to. So it's about reform, about the issue that we're, we have major, major um, systems challenges within health and social care. So Professor Bangoa isn't looking at every individual care home or every individual hospital site or what should be done in every GP practice. He'll be looking more at, at the holistic picture about health and social care and how we need to transform. So no, Professor Bengoa isn't involved in terms of where we're going to go with residential care homes. There's a big, a big body of work done already in relation to that. And as I said, I'm considering that report from the board alongside um, talking to my officials. And, and I think it's important that we provide clarity as soon as possible to give those residents and those people that work within those care homes the, the information that they need. As I said, I want to welcome the, the debate um, from today, and I will pick up on any issues which members don't feel I have responded to. But I, the one thing I would say that you know, transformation and reconfiguration won't be easy, and it's going to require difficult decisions, and it's going to um, require us all to be really serious about delivering better outcomes for individuals. That's what it has to be about. It can't be about being wedded to buildings. It has to be about how can we, as an executive, deliver the best possible outcomes for individuals. If the minister could bring her remarks to Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So that's what I look forward to debating time and time again, I'm quite sure, in this House with all members. And I encourage members to contact me and talk to me about how they feel, um, we should be, how they feel that we should be transforming health and social care, because I think we have really good opportunity here to get it right, and it's so important that we do so. Members, that concludes the debate, and uh, the Assembly is now adjourned. Thank you.